Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this playlist, we've looked at the notion of a quaternion algebra, which is a non-commutative generalization of a quadratic field extension. In this video, I want to talk about a very interesting construction of central simple algebras, that of the cyclic algebra. And one can think of this as a non-commutative generalization of cyclic field extensions. Okay, so to begin uh, this video, I want to give some motivation for this notion of a cyclic algebra. And I want to start here very simply with our Hamiltonians. Okay, so let's just think about what that is and remind ourselves. So here, uh, this is a four dimensional real vector space. Okay, and we can give a basis. So, firstly, there's just a copy of R, so that's actually a subfield. And then you take the direct sum of r times i, where i is the square root of minus 1. And then we have another square root of minus 1, which is j. And then finally, we have a third square root of minus 1, which is the product of i with j. And the thing is, what you'll notice is that when you look at the multiplication, you can look at the subspace that's generated by this uh, 1, okay, and also by r, i. So that gives you what? That gives, actually gives you a, a subring, which is actually just a copy of the complex numbers. And the other part here you can also think of as a copy of the complex numbers times j. Okay, you can pull out a j from the right hand side, and then what you'll get are just complex numbers times j. So another way to write this out is it's just equal to c direct sum c j okay but what's rather interesting in this case is the way that some scalar alpha inside c commutes past j okay it doesn't just commute straight through okay because remember uh, in the hamiltonians j i equals minus i j so when you use this formula here and also use the fact that j commutes with all real numbers, what do you find? If you want to multiply j times alpha, it doesn't equal alpha j, it equals alpha conjugate times j. Okay, so the reason why the conjugate goes in is because the part involves the i gets changed to a negative and so that means you're uh, negating the imaginary part, but the real part it just commutes as per normal. Okay, so one way to think of this Hamiltonian, so you can think of it instead of just an extension of R, okay, it has this subring R, it actually has a subring C, okay, and so you can form the Hamiltonians by adjoining this square root of minus 1J, okay, so it's a C direct sum CJ, but the thing that you have to realize now is that J does not um, commute through this C, okay, uh, you have to use this rather interesting formula here, it's what's called skew commutes, okay, so j alpha is now alpha conjugate times j. Okay, so to uh, formulate a general notion of what's going on, I'm going to tell you about the skew polynomial ring. So more generally, suppose you have any ring R here, and we're going to pick some automorphism sigma, an automorphism of R. So in the above example, we have the complex numbers and the automorphism is just sigma equals the conjugation, okay? So it's an automorphism since conjugation is uh, preserves multiplication and addition. What we can do now is we can talk about what's called the skew polynomial ring, Rx, except for we're going to also use this automorphism sigma. Okay, so it looks a lot like the usual polynomial ring. In fact, the additive structure is the same, okay? So basically, it's going to be uh, a direct sum of r times powers of x, non-negative powers of x, rx to the n. And then the only thing that I need to do now is to show you how to multiply things, okay? So this is a left free r module, okay? And to multiply, since a multiplication has to be, satisfy the distributive law, I just have to tell you how to multiply uh, a, on a spanning set or on a basis in this case, okay? So suppose you're given um, uh, elements inside some Rxn, so maybe some uh, beta x to the n, and then you have some alpha x to the m. 
so where alpha, beta are inside R. Okay, so the multiplication is just given by essentially juxtaposition, except for the only problem here is that, well, how do you simplify an expression like this? And the only thing that you need to know is how do you pass this alpha through the x? Okay, and so the way we're going to do it is rather than just commuting the alpha through, so x alpha is not just alpha x, it's now sigma alpha x. Okay, so that will change, possibly change this alpha when you push it through, but it will still be some element of r, because sigma sends elements of r back to r. And it turns out that uh, you can show that this gives you an associative multiplication, so you get an honest uh, ring on this free left r module. Okay, so it also turns out to be a free right R module with the same generators, um, but the important thing is the left action of R and the right action of R are different. Okay, so just as in this case, case here, the left action of C is given by the usual multiplication, but the right action is twisted through, so to speak, by conjugation. Okay, so now the way we can think about this Hamiltonians, okay, is we can think of this C and you're going to join now some, let's think of it firstly as a, a variable, j, and then you have sigma equals conjugation, okay, and that will give you this relation here, and then you need to set j squared equal to minus 1, so we're going to factor out by the ideal generated by j squared plus 1, and this gives us quite a different way of looking at this Hamiltonian algebra. Okay, it uses this skew polynomial ring, and you factor out by this uh, um, ideal here. So in this way, it looks a lot like a uh, how you often build um, field extensions. Okay, we're going to just adjoin an element to a field C in this case. Okay, and that element is going to be a square root of minus one. And the thing that's interesting in this case, of course, if you try to do this with a, a commutative field extension this way, you won't get a field coming out of it, okay? But in this case here, you will get a division ring, and that's because of the non-commutativity that you've put in there. Okay, great. So let's move on to the general sort of construction here. So the skew polynomial ring works uh, fairly generally, and so does the... Um, this notion that I'm going to introduce now, but I'll restrict to the case where R is a commutative ring, okay, just to simplify things a little bit. And then, as usual, we'll also have some automorphism, sigma, and the automorphism, we're going to insist this has finite order, okay. So when we have that, remember there's something called a fixed string, so that's denoted as follows with this R with a superscript sigma, okay. So that's a subring of R, so what elements of R are in there? They're the ones such that sigma of R equals R. Sigma doesn't change it, sigma fixes those elements of R. And it's quite easy to see that since sigma is an automorphism, okay, that uh, this the set of solutions to this equation is closed under addition and multiplication and so you get some sort of a subring, and of course one is in there as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to just generalize the definition that we saw before for uh, Hamiltonians um, as a quotient of the uh, skew polynomial ring. Okay, so we're doing the R and sigma as above, and now we need an extra uh, piece of data, and that's going to be an element A, which is inside the units in the fixed ring. Okay, so the cross here just denotes the units, okay? So the definition is fine without this units, but later on we'll need this. And this is, uh, once you're given this data, these three pieces of data, R, sigma, A, you can form something called the generalized cyclic algebra. Okay, so I've called it the generalized cyclic algebra. Uh, it's a bit more general than the usual notion, but uh, to keep the treatment simple, um, I'll, I'll do it in this uh, setting, okay? So we're going to uh, form this skew polynomial ring, and then we're going to uh, suppose the variable sx that we added, and this x we're going to now um, set some power of it equal to this a that we chose. Okay, so we're going to factor up by x to the n minus a. Okay, 
So before, in the Hamiltonian case, so remember, uh, in the Hamiltonian case, we had minus 1, minus 1, R. You could also write as C direct sum CJ. So J here was some square root of minus 1. Okay, the order of the automorphism was 2, so that was n. And then the nth, the nth root that we put in was um, uh, the square root of minus 1, which is this j. Okay, so here we have a basis of 1 and j. In general, there's a left r basis, which is quite nice. It's 1, x, x squared, all the way up to x to the n minus 1. Okay, that's a left r basis, and that's something that you see. Okay, so another nice fact about this cyclic algebra is you can actually say what the center is. And the center is just a fixed string. And it's quite easy to see uh, why that's the case. Okay, so let's just check, for example, this inclusion here. Okay, so uh, let's suppose we pick something that's in uh, here. Okay, so let's suppose we pick an R inside there. You need to show that it's in the center of this algebra here. Now R is commutative, so of course this R commutes with everything inside this R. So since this algebra is generated by this R and this X, you just have to show that it commutes with X. Okay, so what's R times X? Okay, let me write it down the other way actually. Uh, what's X times R? Well, by our skew commutation relation, that's a relation inside this skew polynomial ring, this is just sigma of Rx. And since R is fixed, that means that that's just Rx. And reversing this sort of um, equation shows you essentially the, re the reverse inclusion. I mean, you have to check polynomials as well, and it's quite easy to check that um, uh, you can't have powers, higher powers of x involved in the center. So, so the center has to be just um, degree zero um, elements in this skew polynomial ring, so to speak. And which degree zero elements, or so which elements inside R? Just the fixed elements. Okay, so they're two nice facts. So let's just see how this fact plays out in the example of the quaternions. Okay, so in that case here, the, the uh, automorphism is conjugation. So what are the elements of the complex numbers which are fixed under conjugation? They're just the real numbers, okay? And so the center of the quaternion turns out to be the um, field of real numbers. Okay, so I want to go through another rather interesting example of a cyclic algebra, and that's matrix rings. So remember, central simple algebras, the way I defined them, are just things that essentially when you uh, change the scalars, okay, by doing some finite field extension, you get matrix rings. So let me show you what goes on here. So the algebra I want to do is, uh, I'm going to firstly fix a field K, and I want to look at a full matrix ring. So let's just, for ease of notation, uh, put in M3K here, okay. So inside this, um, you can look at the subring of diagonal matrices, okay, R. And that's going to be uh, isomorphic to K cross K cross K. Okay, if you want to visualize it, I guess you should write it out. So it's going to be K, 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 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And of course, you can see that if you want to uh, add or multiply two of these diagonal matrices, right, you just have to do it. Um, uh, entry-wise on each of those coordinates. That's how matrix multiplication will work. And that's, of course, the same as the addition and multiplication in this product of three copies of K. Okay, so now what do I want to do? I want to introduce the following element, X equals... Uh, I want to find generators and relations. Okay, so... Uh, here you have a subring of this 3x3 three three matrices, uh, this... Uh, uh, algebra of three by three matrices. And I want to show that um, over R, this is generated by this single element X. And what is that element X? So R is, lives on the diagonal. So we're gonna pick something that doesn't live on the diagonal. Okay. It's gonna be this matrix here. Okay, so what is this uh, matrix here? So if you think of it in terms of what it does to the entries, it's cyclic per permutes the entries okay so in other words remember this is a three by three matrix so it acts on k3 
okay and what does it do to the entries it just cyclically mutes them so I hope you can see what x squared has to be okay when you square x um, you can work that out what that is so in the first column you'll have um, 0 1 0 okay in the second column you have 0 0 1 and in the third column you have 1 0 0 so that's where you cyclically permute them twice or you do the inverse since here um, your dimension 3 and then x cubed is equal to what x cubed now since uh, you're cyclically permuting and there are only three things you're permuting uh, you get the identity matrix okay so here this is a this x here this matrix here is a cube root of the identity you um, you've in a here uh, it contains this cube root of the identity and let's have a little look and see how this uh, x commutes or fails to commute with elements inside r okay so let's just have a look at that zero zero one one zero zero one zero zero and you're going to multiply this by let's say a one a two a three okay so what this does it multiplying by on the right by this matrix here is going to multiply the columns by the corresponding scalars so you get zero zero a one a two zero zero and zero a three zero and then you can actually write this so there's our x and then um, so let me call this element um, a say and then what you can do is that you can put now this x on the right and since it's invertible you can actually uh, find some matrix here some matrix here um, and I guess one way you can do it is you can just compute it but the key thing is that actually if you're clever about what goes on uh, you can multiply this uh, if you multiply on the left by a diagonal matrix that multiplies the corresponding rows okay so that means here what you'll have is you want to multiply this first row this first row here to get that by a2 so that means that you need an a2 here the second row you want to multiply that by a3 to get the second row here so you have a3 and then the first row is a1 okay so that's rather curious okay what happens is that this is just what here you have x and here you have another diagonal matrix and it's very closely related to the original one it's just gotten by permuting cyclically the entries and we're going to call this sigma of a that cyclic permutation okay and what else do you see about what's going on here okay if you look at this uh, so maybe I've got just enough space up here okay m3k to get all the diagonal entries you just need R to get all the um, entries which live just above the diagonal or in this lot here you just need to look at R times X and of course this uh, the sum of those two is direct and if you think about what happens with x squared where does x squared where are the entries here they're in the three remaining positions and a similar sort of an analysis will show you that um, therefore three by three matrices in k is a direct sum of these three um, copies of r r direct sum rx direct sum rx squared okay so it's generated by x which is a cube root of one and also this x skew commutes with this uh, these diagonal matrices and the way it skew commutes is via this automorphism which cyclically permutes those diagonal entries 
So I've done the 3x3 case so it can fit nicely on this page here, but I hope you can see it's quite easy to extend this example to um, n by n matrices over a field. Okay, And what we've shown is this wonderful result here. Okay, So this gives you generators and relations for this a matrix algebra um, where, where you're looking at a, a, an extension of this commutative ring, which is just R equals n copies of K. Okay, you have sigma is some sort of cyclic permutation of the coordinates, so and that's clearly a, a ring automorphism. And then this n by n matrices is just gone on by adjoining uh, in this skew polynomial ring here this x, okay, which is an nth root of the identity. Okay, so this uh, n by n matrices in this field is a particular example of a cyclic algebra, where the cyclic algebra R equals uh, Kn, and sigma is this cyclic permutation, and we put a 1 here. Okay? Okay, so let's see how this is related to central simple algebras. Okay, so this is the first key that tells you that maybe this is useful for central simple algebras. Okay, so I want to specialize a little bit to this situation we're interested in here. The R here will just be a field F. And the fixed ring, remember, is going to be important. That gives you the uh, center of uh, the, um, these uh, cyclic algebras. I'm going to call it K. Okay. So this is going to be the, the fixed ring with respect to some sigma for some n is an order n automorphism of this big field F. Now, before, when we looked at the quaternion algebra and for quadratic field extensions, we had... Uh, norm maps. So there's a norm map in this case. If you've seen Galois theory, you would have seen this before. Okay. So the big field is F. And the way I'll write it is I want to just look at the non-zero elements, so the uh, multiplicative group of F. And this norm of F over K is going to be uh, a map, a multiplicative map from F cross down to the units in the fixed uh, ring. So that's to K cross. And the way it's defined is fairly simple. If you have a B inside here, okay, what does it map to? So it's very similar to what we saw before. So in the quadratic field extension case, you just multiply a number by its conjugate, so to speak. Well, here now it's a little bit more subtle. You have to do B times sigma of B times sigma squared of B all the way down to sigma to the n minus 1 of B. Okay, so sigma is... Uh, uh, multiplicative being an automorphism, so the same is true of sigma squared all the way down to sigma to the n minus 1. So when you uh, look at the, this product here, this map here is also multiplicative. Okay, and so I guess the other question that you want to ask is, of course, you know that this element here certainly does lie inside f, okay, you're multiplying elements of f, okay, it's elements of f multiplied by um, uh, the images under this automorphism sigma, okay, but why does it land inside this k cross? So certainly if you input something non-zero, the product will be non-zero, but why does it land in the fixed string? So why is this fixed by sigma? And so I guess the thing to check that it's fixed by sigma is you just uh, apply sigma to it. And let's just see what happens when you apply sigma to it. Uh, sigma is multiplicative. So you get here sigma of b, sigma squared of b, times all the way up to sigma to the n of b. And if you uh, remember, sigma is order n. So this here is just b. And essentially what you have done is you've just written out the same product, but uh, in a permuted order. And that's why it's fixed. Okay, so that gets you some element um, which is fixed. Okay, so let's have a look and see what goes on here. So here, uh, F is the big field, and you have some automorphism of it. And let's suppose we have some unit inside the fixed string. Okay, so you can form this cyclic algebra. Okay, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to change this A by something which is a norm. Okay, so remember the norm also gives you something inside k cross. So that gives you a new one. Okay, so here b, this is for any b, an element of f cross. Okay. And then what happens here? Okay. So what you can do is uh, you can change this uh, a 
by this norm, and you'll get an isomorphic uh, cyclic algebra. By the way, see these are the classical sort of uh, cyclic algebras. And the key fact here, which is important, is that in this case, this F sigma A is a central simple K algebra. Okay, so we know the center is K, and in fact, it's also simple as well, and it's going to be finite dimensional. Okay, so let me just briefly show you why this is true, or indicate why it's true. And it's the same as the uh, proof for the fact that quaternion algebras uh, give you uh, central simple algebras. Okay, so there are the matrices or division rings. Okay, so the first one is uh, sort of a key thing to look at. And what we're going to do is we're just going to change variables. So this um, F sigma A, that's going to be some essentially some uh, skew polynomial ring and you factor out by x to the n minus a. And what you can do is you can change variables. Suppose you change variables to y equals um, b x. Okay. Uh, so b here will be non-zero. Okay, it's going to be non-zero. And when you do that, what do you find? Well, actually, now this uh, this algebra here, okay, is also generated by f and y now, okay, so this is some, uh, it's generated by f and y, and this y also skew commutes with this, uh, this f, because well, what happens when you try to pass a scalar through this, okay, if you pass a scalar through this, okay, Normally, when you pass it through this this x here, that scalar gets twisted by the sigma, and then since b is inside f and f is commutative, that's uh, that twisted scalar gets pushed through. Okay, so you can actually pass a scalar through this y, okay, and it will change the same way as when you pass it through the x because um, it doesn't change when you push it through b. Okay. So uh, you can also think of this as a quotient of a skew polynomial ring, but with this y instead. And so the key question is, what is y to the n? What's the new relationship? Okay, instead of having x to the n equals a, what's the new relationship? So let's work out what this is. So what's y to the n equals bx times bx times all the way to bx so many times. And I guess the key point is that um, when you work this out, well, what do you have to do? So you look at this b here, okay, you want to commute that through this x. So that gets you a sigma of b, okay. But there's also another b over, um, maybe I'll write this out a little bit more clearly, with a, a, an extra factor in here, an extra bx. Okay, and then you have to commute this b through this x, so that will twist it by sigma, and then this b has been moved over, and then you have to twist that by another um, sigma because it has to pass through a second x. So that means you, that you get a, a sigma squared b as well. Okay, and when you go through, pass through all these b's to the left hand side, at the end of the day, how much have you changed it? You've changed it by norm of b. I'll drop the, super, the subscript there, norm of b times x to the n. And this is just a. So now instead of having an nth root of a, this y is an nth root of this thing here. Okay. So that's rather interesting. Okay, that you can change uh, this a by a norm from this field extension. This what's called a cyclic field extension, and you'll get an, uh, the same cyclic algebra. Okay. So that's pretty neat that that's uh, true, okay? And it also shows you how norms are very, very uh, much a part of this theory, okay? So this theory, these non-commutative algebras can actually tell you about norms, and norms are things that are very interesting in number theory. Okay, so let's look at the final part of what's going on here, and that's to look at this um, central simple, to show that this uh, cyclic algebra here in this special instance where f is a field and uh, gives you a central simple k algebra. So why is that the case? Okay, so let's have a look at this f sigma a again. Here it is. And if you think about it, let's just uh, uh, do some sort of um, 
space change, okay, so we want to uh, tensor up by some field extension, okay, and this is a tensor over uh, k. Okay, so what we're going to do here now is we're going to uh, tensor over um, some algebraic closure of k, and then what will happen? Okay, so you do k algebraic closure tensor over k of f sigma of a. And then essentially, and this is something that we've kind of seen a bit of before, what you'll get here is you'll get a, another cyclic algebra. You can think about it. What you've just done is you've, you, you've tensored this with uh, k bar over uh, k. So this changes, but all you do is essentially make a similar extension of this k, k bar tensor k f. Okay, you're it's joined by this x, so that's still there. The x to the n still is an n, uh, x is still an nth root of a. And you can extend the automorphism. So basically, this is essentially the same as that here. Okay. And then what do you find out? So what do you find out? Well, the point is that this f, remember, you can write as by the uh, primitive element theorem, is essentially just you join something to um, uh, k. Okay. So maybe it's k adjoined z. And then there's some minimal polynomial of z, so p of z. And when you tensor over k bar, you just change this k to k bar. So of course this is going to split. Okay, so this is isomorphic to just it turns out to be n copies of k bar. And in fact, instead of using k bar, we could have just picked a finite field extension where which includes all the um, roots of p of z. Okay, and so if you pick that finite field extension, you'll still get uh, this splitting, so to speak. Okay, so then this is starting to look like the example of the matrix algebras. Okay, and the only thing that's different is this A here. And the point is that, well, you can still define this multiplicative norm map in the case of uh, the, um, the cyclic extension where you get k bar n instead. So you, so, um, you still have this uh, map here. That's well defined. Okay, you just need the sigma. You didn't need the fact that this r was a field. Okay, And the point is that in that special case there, it's quite easy to see that anything is a norm. So you can change this a to a 1 if you like. So that shows you that this is isomorphic to m in k algebraic closure and then you can actually restrict this algebraic cl closure this k algebraically close just to any field as long as it contains the roots of p of z okay so to sum up we've shown a very interesting construction of the of a central simple algebra that's this cyclic algebra here Okay, and essentially the way you think of it is you start off with a cyclic field extension. So essentially what you do is you have a field F and some automorphism, um, uh, which is of order N. So that generates a um, an cyclic group of order N. Okay, and then what you do is uh, you essentially form this skew polynomial ring now and, and Adjoin an nth root of something in the fixed ring, okay, something non zero in the fixed ring, and that gives you a central simple algebra over this fixed field here, k. Okay. okay, I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.